has a little something to do with the series and, and what you're hearing about it and the experiences that you're having with it. Um, probably has a little something to do with our guest tonight as well, so it's great to see you all here. Um, you're probably wondering who I am. My name is Ron Buffington. Um, I'm the head of the Department of Art here at UTC. I'm really excited to have you with us uh, tonight as we welcome to campus our Spring 2015 Dianeric Visiting Artist, John Monica. Um, tonight, Monica will be uh, lecturing about her work, um, and then we'll open her exhibition, Milk Fruit, in the Crest Gallery. Monica will uh, spend about a week with us all together, uh, meeting with members of the Chattanooga Arts community, uh, making presentations on the process and her approach to materials, which I'm really looking forward to seeing this exhibition, even in reproduction, you know it's going to be a really fascinating conversation. And uh, conducting studio visits with our upper division EFA majors, among numerous other activities. This uh, depth of engagement is a unique feature of this series, and it's possible thanks to the generosity of the artist, the energy and ambition of our director and curator, Ruth Grover, um, the ongoing support of the Merrick family. Do we have 10? Is 10 for tonight? There you go. 10, 10, 10, 10. And of course, the vision of Diane Merrick. We're grateful to you all. Who we all. I'd also like to take just a moment to recognize the friends of the gallery, as we have some in the audience. Uh, donations from the friends make the exhibitions associated with the series possible. And it's really this coupling of a meaningful visit a long-term extended meaningful visit and a contemporaneous exhibition that makes this program truly unique. Uh, to those friends in the gallery and the audience, uh, thank you for your support. And finally, of course, thank you all for being here. Um, I, I assure you you're in for a treat tonight. Um, Milk Fruit is a stunning exhibition. It's uh, a sensuous piece and it's profound. Um, so I'll turn the floor over to Ruth Grover who will introduce Monica to Enjoy yourself, Simon. <laughs> Just to emphasize a few points Ron made, um, uh, this, this series is um, indebted to the vision of Diane Merrick, who uh, emphasized bringing in artists for five to seven days for visits to Chattanooga. Um, involving them with the community and with campus activities in association with an exhibition of their work in the Crest Gallery. And that's what makes this series very special, that association of exhibition and artist. Uh, and of course, uh, while the Merrick Fund uh, pays for the cost of bringing the artist here, the Friends of the Gallery pay for the exhibitions and I can't thank you enough for that support and encourage you all to continue to support, become a friend of the gallery uh, and support the arts, uh, visual arts at UTC. Um, Monica Cook received her BFA from Savannah College of Art and Design, Savannah, Georgia. She further studied in the off-campus program of the Savannah College of Art and Design in New York City the Studio Residency Program of the School of the Visual Arts in New York City, and the Residency Program of uh, Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Um, her work has appeared in many group exhibitions nationwide, and in Germany, Denmark, Croatia, Canada. Solo exhibitions include those at Marsha Wood Gallery in Atlanta, Georgia, and Postmasters Gallery in New York City the latter of which now currently represents her work. Um, her work is included in numerous uh, pro private and public collections and was recently acquired by the 21st Century Museum Hotel Collection in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Monica lives and works in Brooklyn, New York, and in addition to her studio practice, she teaches at the New York Academy of Art in New York City. Now the thing, uh, many people ask me about, uh, you know, how we discover these artists, what, why artists are chosen or whatever, but uh, I first met Monica's painting in 2010 
at Marsha Wood Gallery in Atlanta, Georgia. And Marsha encouraged me to, to consider Monica's work. Uh, I then met her sculpture in, I believe, um, 2011. I met her animation in 2011 in Miami. Uh, and uh, finally, one day, I realized that all these Monica Cooks were one person. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's in, in addition to that, she's a native of Dalton. Georgia, which is really a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to bring someone who's contributing at the level Monica's contributing to the contemporary art scene, um, and a native with Dalton as well. And it's Monica who recalls that during her junior and senior year in high school in Dalton, she would regularly drive the trip to Chattanooga on Tuesday nights to draw with the life drawing um, community cooperative that still meets um, in, in the Department of Art here on this campus. And what uh, a, uh, a boost uh, that was to her career. So without any further ado, let's bring up all the Monica Cooks I've known. <laughs> spend a lot of time just uh, walking around the streets and collecting the materials which you'll see uh, in, the, in the gallery. Um, but here I, I did a little series of paintings um, where I would skin mattresses that were left on the curbside. Um, and this was before I knew about the bed bug. <laughs> and luckily I didn't have any problems, but um, I, was, I was really kind of fascinated with um, the the delicateness of the pattern and the history uh, that was trapped in the skin of the mattress. And kind of like our own skin uh, holds this history. And um, the, you can kind of see the, um, the rest marks from the, this was a box spring um, that had bled through. This is also a mattress and I'm using that same stencil. And um, this was some linoleum kind of playing with the pattern and the texture of that. And I did uh, several paintings using um, the stencil, but also uh, trying to push the, the patterning even more um, with uh, tape lines. And, um, that was a 
triptych. So this piece was uh, kind of a turning point piece for me. Um, I was uh, trying to find a way to have the figure feel like it was um, coming out of the background or, or emerging into it. And um, I thought, well, maybe if I paint myself white and then stand in front of a white wall and do the photo shoot, it'll be easier for me to find this push and pull. And um, instead of using paint, I decided I'd use yogurt. And um, it didn't have the effect that I was looking for, but it um, kind of changed my direction because the way that the yogurt sat on the skin um, kind of, um, it followed the contours of my skin and it also became a second skin in a way and um, really uh, accentuated the luminosity and the, um, the kind of shimmeriness of the skin. And I realized that that was really where my um, biggest um, fascination with painting was. It wasn't about so much about this background thing, it was, just, it was more about the flesh and um, trying to capture the translucency and um, the luminosity of the skin. Um, and during the same time, I was commissioned uh, through SCAD to do these uh, Thayer Lang wedding dress paintings. And when I first got the commission, I kind of you know, rolled it around in my head trying to come up with a way to make it interesting for myself. Um, and I kind of envisioned this uh, bride coming out of water, kind of like Ophelia, and um, it being like a milky pool, and then her being adorned with um, uh, crustaceans or something like a mermaid. And um, so I had heard about this artist who did taxidermy in Manhattan, and he gave these tours in Chinatown, uh, he called Taxidermy Tour. And um, it was after hours, uh, he would take you around to the different, um, like outside the markets that sold seafood. And um, they would throw away mass amounts of sea creatures at the end of the day. And you could kind of, there were different areas where you could pick, pick what you wanted. So I uh, went there and got some industrial black garbage bags and um, some big gloves <laughs> and loaded my bag with as many crabs as I could carry, thinking I could, you know, fill a whole tub with them. I got a kiddie pool and um, I triple bagged it, quadruple bagged it, and, and I had to take it on the train because I had to get it. <laughs> so I drag it onto the train and of course the, the weight of these hundreds of crabs start to poke through the plastic bags, and then this like awful liquid starts coming. <laughs> it was on like a weekend night, so um, I very quickly cleared the train and uh, had like my own private car always. <laughs> um, so then I was really just focused on the idea of skin and uh, second skin. And wanted to play with um, the ideas of kind of uh, transforming uh, the body into something else. And I found this mask uh, at a stoop sale. It was a Chewbacca. And um, the back of it had started to kind of decompose. And the hair had fallen off and it. The latex had started to crust over, but it was starting to turn different colors and it looked really beautiful, like some, it was shimmery, like some kind of uh, sea creature skin. <laughs> So I did this, um, I did a little series with it, and it was more about like um, the ambiguity of it, because you really can't tell what it is. Um, and then also playing with uh, transforming myself just with the cornstarch. Mm -hmm. um, so about eight years ago, I um, rented out my studio in New York and rented a studio in Paris. And it was the first time that I'd ever really traveled by myself. And um, I think it was one of the best experiences um, for my work. And I highly recommend for everybody when you get out of school to travel as much as you can. Um, uh, it was not only gave me a lot of courage, but it um, having the silence of being somewhere where I didn't speak the language and didn't know anyone was uh, very, um, informative to my work and gave me, it 
piece that I couldn't really find other places. Um, and this painting I did in my um, my apartment that I had rented was my birthday, and I was there alone, so I bought myself a cake and uh, had myself a little photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and these are also um, paintings done while I was there. And this was um, one of the apartments. I kind of had to hop around a bit. One of the apartments that I subletted while I was there. And I thought maybe, you know, and my backgrounds have been so boring, and I thought maybe I should try painting the background, and, and I realized that that was terribly boring for me. <laughs> and this is the only one that I ever did uh, with, the, with the full background, because it's um, not really my cup of tea, but it was exciting to try. <laughs> uh, so when I got back to New York, um, I kind of ditched the background, and um, I wanted to try to find a way to bring um, that comfort that I found in the unfamiliar into my work in New York. And um, so I asked my friend Deborah if she would propose for me, and um, and I thought would put her in a really uncomfortable situation. And she's very adventurous, and uh, said yes. And so I. It was cold in the kitchen, and I poured honey on her, and the honey was cold, and it was very uncomfortable, and it was awkward for both of us, and um, I took you know, like, the, all these photos, and then finally, after about 500 photos, uh, we both kind of let go, and Deborah, there's this one photo out of all that I took where she has this kind of dopey, um, blissed out look on her face where she did let go of the discomfort and the awkwardness, and um, and she kind of uh, released into it, and I just think it's such a beautiful expression. And this was a little bit harder for her to, <laughs> 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 to like, relax into than she ultimately did. Uh, so I started picking a lot of the um, things that I was interacting with that were uncomfortable, um, that would have uh, surfaces and textures that I would that I found really fascinating that I could kind of bring into the skin of the humans. Um, the, the pig skin is very similar to her pig skin. Um, and then and a lot of them I also just kind of let the fruits or whatever not be the, the main thing and it mainly be about the surface of the skin and um, kind of the, the second skin that starts to develop after the, from the pulps and juices and things. And this was the following year. I painted this one um, in a say in Berlin and kind of revisited my birthday uh, cake. Um, this body of work, uh, I um, wanted to kind of come up with some kind of role play that I could explore um, more directly and like more humorously the idea of these extremes that keep following through my work and um, you know, have the comfort and unease and the uh, repulsion and attraction. And so I decided to divide myself into two characters, one who is the official, who wears this uniform that signifies her pious, dignified, um, controlling manner. And then the official, or the naked, who um, whose nudity is about her innocence and curiosity and sense of abandon. Uh, and they just kind of fight each other and um, battle it out. And sometimes um, they cross into each other's territory and, um, and kind of bleed into one another, but they never, uh, no one ever wins. It's just a, a, a kind of absurd battle between uh, our extremes and So then I decided to do oil paintings based on these characters as well, and mainly dealing with the uh, different fruits. And um, they started to become even more kind of busted up and, um, and gluttonous in a way. Um, here the official is kind of um, 
rationing the food to the naked, and but you can tell she's, you know, she hasn't been too official herself because she's kind of got a lot of pulp and fruit on her as well. So it's not really a power struggle between them, but more like a truce and kind of like they're on the sidelines and having a snack. <laughs> um, and this is uh, kind of pushed even further to where the, the fruits and the, um, the fish and things are just busted and there's a confusion of the substances and it starts to look kind of like entrails and um, you know you can't really tell if the fish only has just uh, gorged herself and she's bloated laying there or if uh, she kind of gave up control and just, just passed out right there. But, um, I felt like once it started getting to this level, it was um, started to be more about like the the tension um, of the skin and what's inside the skin, and um, how delicate that is. And you know, I find the inside of the body, the body itself, totally fascinating. Um, but we have no control over it, and I think that's uh, really terrifying as well. And so this is kind of about the abandoning. The, the nakeds are just kind of uh, abandoning themselves to um, uh, this like frolicking and the, the letting go and the loss of, of controlling. And this was the last painting um, of that series that I did, and it just became more of a tangle of, of flesh and beast, and you can't really tell if something, like who's devouring what. Um, and after this painting, I. I decided I was at a crossroads and I needed to really make a big change. Um, I wasn't really happy with the way that I was painting and I kind of become um, seduced by technique and not really, um, uh, hadn't really um, given myself the chance to explore uh, my own, um, the own world inside of me instead of being so tied to the photograph and tied to reality. So I tried painting for my imagination and it was uh, not fun. Um, <laughs> I realized that I, I, I really depend and, and only really love to um, take the surfaces and light and um, I can't pull those things from my mind. So I decided that I needed to just build sculptures and then paint from them. And then that way I would be able to look at um, something that's tangible. Uh, so I started making these sculptures, and I had no idea what I was doing as far as materials, but I thought with the wire armature and clay that I can, um, and then I use Sculpey clay that's like a polymer-based clay that doesn't dry so that I can keep manipulating the faces and the hands. And my friend Amber Boardman, who's an animator, came into my studio when I was building these, and she said, well, you should really think about animation because these are perfect for stop motion. I never even considered, and I kind of followed her lead and um, kind of came up with a, a story based on the characters that I already had built, and that's where I uh, created Deuce, which is also in the um, in the gallery. And it was the most um, magical thing to see sculptures that you make actually come to life. And um, uh, these are some stills from Deuce, and um, it kind of still is following the same themes because it's still about um, uh, transformation and um, about not having control. So here, like the, the idea of um, uh, pregnancy and uh, your body kind of taking over and developing this baby and losing that control is just uh, quite really fascinating and beautiful. Um, or the idea of um, lust, uh, passion, causing uh, um, and then after I finished shooting over a month's time, these um, sculptures started to really uh, kind of decompose because the oils of my skin and the dirt um, that would just stick to them from the air was um, trapped in the skin and started to um, break down the clay and then the hairs from my werewolf. And so, um, they became actually more alive to me at this point because they were, um, they had this history and you could look at them and see that they had lived this life and um, I wanted to try to 
um, capture that um, that beauty as they decompose. So I did this photo shoot um, with the characters as they kind of fell apart, and it was like one of the most liberating experiences. And you can see her hands; they look like almost like veins, but it was just a solid clay that built the dirt. So after they fell apart, um, I was totally lost, and um, I wasn't really sure where, where to go. And I, I was so new with sculpture that I um, was a bit intimidated. And um, my friend Summer Wheat, who um, actually was here um, uh, two years ago, um, and probably a lot of you guys might have seen her show, a few and far between. Um, she's an artist that I deeply admire, and um, she's been very instrumental in helping me get through uh, some tough transitions. And she told me, she said, why don't you just go back to your childhood and, and think about what it is that you most wanted to be as a child. And um, so I thought about it, and one of my best memories was um, when I was a little girl and we lived in San Diego, um, we, my mom would take me to the um, zoo, and there was a like a, a little hospital with um, a viewing window, and we would stand there and watch the uh, the little baby monkeys who were um, they were born premature, and so they were not fully formed, and they weren't particularly cute. They were kind of um, uh, like little monsters, but they were very um, sweet and, and vulnerable, and uh, with all the tubes and pumps and uh, they knitted little hats for them, pink and blue, and booties, and, and I thought there was nothing in the world that I would rather do than uh, take care of those little monkeys. So I created a bunch of little monkeys that needed to be taken care of. <laughs> and um, uh, they, I gave them also, uh, I wanted them to have a history in their bodies, like the history that Deuce, the two characters in Deuce had. They, um, they developed the history through the animation, but I wanted to see what it would be like if they already had that history when they entered the animation so that it would maybe make them more convincing of being alive. So I gave them flaws and scars, and um, I also built them from the inside out so that their skeletal structure was there, and they had organs and pumps and tubes to where they could put those heartbeats and so that they could breathe um, or have milk. These are the, the monkeys that were featured in, in Bali, which is also playing in the academy. I also, with these guys, wanted them to have um, human kind of characteristics or qualities so that it would kind of push the uncanniness of when you see yourself in some other creature. Uh, these are stills from Bali. So this brings us to milk fruit, which um, I was given a, res a residency uh, shortly after Bali, um, where it was in Skakigan, um, Maine, and um, they gave me a studio in the middle of a cow field, and um, the cow would—it was a pretty big field. But even when they, they when they got to know you, they would see you from afar and come running when you entered the field and. My studio just opened right up to um, the the cows, and they would they're like big dogs. They'd stand at my door and moo for me because they wanted some attention or apples or something. So um, I got to know these cows, and they um, became good friends. And I would sit out in the field with them, and I started working out in the field, and I started building this cow while I was there. And I also visited a lot of. Um, uh, dairy farms, and uh, some of them were really beautiful and sweet, and others were um, heartbreaking. And it got me thinking about uh, the sacrifice these animals uh, give, and um, unwillingly give, and also about sacrifices in general, like the sacrifices of our parents, and uh, the sacrifices um, for our work or for our relationships. And, um, I wanted to do something that would kind of honor the sacrifices of this cow and um, have her on some kind of a float like she was a um, beauty queen, um, 
a pageant of you know, folks coming through that would be um, somewhat a celebration of her um, sacrifice down to the last drop of milk. Um, so here she is, and she's on this bed that is a hollow tank for holding water, and so the milk would drain into the, the bed of the um, tiller and um, into the, those little um, bottles and in the path of the tiller wheels so that when the birds pulled it across the soil, it would till the uh, milk into the earth and nurture the soil the earth. And then this is a spaceship um, called the Crop Duster, or the um, Space Duster, and um, a model after a crop duster um, in outer space. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's Coco in the back, and he's a, a rooster who is the co-pilot for Valentinus, who's the, the ship commander. And um, they fly through um, outer space and, and spray the milk um, in the solar system. These are some other things. These were shots from the show and um, Postmasters in New York. And that's Coco's little um, dune buggy that they are like uh, solo research and um, This is the goat cart, and um, it's pulled by um, gunpowder, the goat, and then uh, carries pitch and snowfall. And, um, they drive um, across the land, and um, there's a, a tank in the back that holds um, milk for a fountain, um, and they, they nurture all the little creatures of the land. So I started shooting these um, sculptures a couple months ago, and these are some some stills I haven't finished shooting or started editing, um, but this will kind of give you an idea of the where it's going to go, and when I first started, I came up with this elaborate storyboard, and um, then once I started shooting, these characters had an eight personalities that I had no control of. I mean, part of it's the way that they are able to move and interact, and so they began kind of to dictate the story, and so I ditched my, um, my storyboard and just tried to be more of a conduit and allow um, allow the story just to come through me instead of out of me or from me. Um, and um, so in a way it was it was like every day I was kind of um, surprised and excited because I didn't know what was really going to happen next. It was just like all play. And, um, and it ended up somehow kind of coming together. So a lot of the background was um, I didn't have time to build a set, so I just used uh, this metallic silver paper, and I shot a lot of the film through the paper, uh, the, the reflections, instead of shooting the actual um, uh, sculptures. Oh, sorry. There's like all kinds of material, starfish for teeth and um, carpet foam and buoys and corn. And um, this is phosphine. It's the one of the last sculptures that I did. Um, I had come across all of um, these windshields. I had um, like 50 windshields and um, was trying to find out what I, how I wanted to work with them and figured out that if you if you hit a windshield enough with a hammer, it kind of turns into fabric, and it holds together by glue, and you can actually use 
tent snips and, and cut it and shape it. And so I, I used it stacked up and um, turned it into a wave. And this is my first time doing like full figure interactive uh, human sculpture. Um, so their bodies uh, above the wave are fleshed out and then what goes below is skeletal. Um, but you can see here they, they still have, I did build them the same way as the monkeys and uh, most of the, the characters in the gallery for milk fruit. They, they all have skeletal systems so some of them, their skin is transparent so you can see the skeleton through the, the skin. And this is a resin. Um, underneath the, the wave was a, um, a reef that I made and used buoys that had washed up from Katrina. Um, and um, then I, and I shaved them to, to create these like shelf mushrooms and um, then cast potatoes and different kinds of tubers and different kinds of barnacles and things to create kind of a little ecosystem below the, the water. And I use um, also a lot of a wax um, encaustic to create kind of like um, his skin. So you can see his head is also a buoy. Um, the, the white part is a buoy with barnacles growing on it that I used as the face. And then the surface of it is kind of covered with little glass beads that kind of soften the harshness of the glass. Um, so, I guess um, I'm at my last slide, and um, for a lot of um, artists and you know, young artists in the room, I really wanted to um, say something about kind of how some of my most difficult um, times of being an artist, and I think um, the biggest struggle that I faced is worrying about what people think, and um, I think as artists, you're, you're kind of laid raw and uh, open for criticism uh, constantly and um, you're exposed, exposing yourself more than most other people, um, some of us more than others, <laughs> but um, regardless it's really tough and um, I don't think it gets any easier, um, but your skin gets thicker if you stick with it. and. Um, I know that in the past when I've created work that I thought people would love, um, it usually failed. But whenever I created work that I love, uh, there was always somebody out there that would love it too. Um, so I'd say my, my, um, my best suggestion uh, for young artists is to um, uh, work really hard and um, Follow your nose and trust your gut and um, just, just muster up all the courage that it takes to create whatever it is that you want to see. Thank you so much.
wanted from me or expected from me. So um, I got a lot of um, flat from collectors and people that uh, it was a pretty drastic departure from the game. Anybody else? Where did you get all of your supplies from? Little skeletons and everything. Uh, I get uh, from a little bit everywhere. Um, I use eBay a lot. Um, and I also go to a lot of junk stores and flea markets and I, I collect trash and jump off the streets. And New York's kind of ideal for a pack rat order with me. <laughs> if you can find anything you want. Anybody else? Why don't you want to talk a little bit about some of your kind of collaborations, like, um, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was uh, actually telling Ruth today at lunch um, about um, Martin Capella, who is the, the composer that did the music for both of my films, and um, hopefully we'll work together on this new one. Um, it was when I was working on Deuce, and I had a, it was for a competition. Um, for, it was a Guggenheim uh, YouTube uh, play show and I was very ambitious and I found out about it and I thought well, I'm going to do it. I had a month. I'd never done an animation before. Um, I had a month to do it and I was just working 24-7 and I was exhausted and about a week before it was due to turn in I um, realized that I didn't have any sound or music and I just never had to think that way and I kind of freaked out and my friend Deborah, who painted for me when she came over and she said, Monica, you just have to get out of the studio, like just go get some food or go get a drink. And I said, no, I don't have time for a drink. I don't have time for food. I got to get this out. And, and um, she kind of wrestled me out. There was an opening down the street and she was like, let's just go have a beer, catch your breath and then come back to the studio and you'll be refreshed. And so I begrudgingly went and um, she was headed to Mexico for the first time, and there were these um, guys at the gallery that were speaking Spanish, and I asked one of them if they were from Mexico, and they were. So um, Deborah started to kind of ask them some questions about her travels, and uh, I started talking with one of the guys, and uh, he asked me what I did, and I was like, oh gosh, I'm doing this animation, and um, you know, I, I, it's just, I'm overwhelmed, I've got this deadline, and he's like, well, who's doing the sound for you? And I was like, I don't know. And he's like, well, I'm a composer. I would be so curious to, um, to see what you're working on. Maybe I can do it. And so we only have a few days. And so he said, well, let me go to your studio. So we went back to the studio. And he loved what he saw. I was still, I hadn't even edited, really. I was still in the process of shooting. So he, um, he did it. He just, I, I, he asked me some questions. I don't know anything about music as far as like, creating it and how to speak about it. So. Um, I kind of came up with a few songs that I liked the, the tempo of or whatever, and then I kind of said I want it to feel like a drunken ship, and uh, I want it to be kind of um, be kind of swanky, and uh, so he kind of put together what I gave him and created that music, and it was just a really beautiful collaboration um, and a gift from God that I walked into him at that moment I was, and it was definitely serendipitous. Any other questions? You, you touched on it a minute ago, but can you talk a little bit more about um, how you have to hold your own in the sense of people with expectations, mm -hmm. especially when you're within the gallery setting, you have dealers, and they expect something of your you know, patrons, they expect something that yeah. you decide to shift. Would you mind talking about that? Yeah, I and mean, it's really tough. It's, tough. it's like when you're working with galleries or with dealers or collectors, you're in a relationship, and um, they have expectations, and rightfully so, because it's, you know, it would be like if you married somebody and then they had a sex change or something. <laughs> 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 so it's a really, I mean, for somebody to go 360 from doing, you know, figurative painting is um, pretty realistic to making these claymation videos. Um, I, had, I ran into really tough problems in it, and I understood, I understood where it came from, but it was also 
I knew that there was no way I could do the work that I was doing and be honest. And if I continued it, it was going to fail. And so I had to take the risk of, I'd rather fail um, by taking a risk that I felt in my gut was right than to fail by being a coward because I'm scared that uh, I'm going to lose um, everything. Like I, I, was, I was doing really well. I was making good money with my paintings. I had, you know, I, 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 I had no problem selling them and had, having a, a good income from them. Uh, so for me to jump out the window and start doing work that was really ugly and kind of my audience went from huge to little, tiny, and I had to like be very patient to find that audience even. And um, it was terrifying, but I, I think that um, you just have to trust your gut and, um, and do what you feel, because I think as you change, uh, your audience also changes. I do think that if you're doing what you feel in your heart you're supposed to be doing, then um, the world opens up to you for that. And the bigger risks you take, the bigger it opens for you. Does that answer it? It's <laughs> true. <laughs> um, have you ever had thoughts to like mix like your painting with sculpture? Yeah, yeah um, I... I think that the closest that I've come, and I have, the, the less, um, I mean, I have thought about it, but I haven't um, done work consciously thinking of it. Um, but I feel like Fos being the last sculpture that I showed you um, was the closest thing that I've come to, because it was like almost, um, it was a very, uh, very different from the other sculptures that I've done. It was kind of romanticism to it, and very classical, um, kind of a strange classical to it that my paintings also had. So um, I think it's going to creep in, and um, it's already started to creep in a bit. So uh, we'll see where it, where it comes out. <laughs> How much uh, actual organic material do you use? Like real bone or? Um... Um, I really try, try not to use, like, I don't want to use anything that's expected for what it is. So if it's um, like a feather, I'd rather use a fly water. Or if it's um, uh, um, I don't know for for the bones, I made all the bones myself, or tried to use like um, parts of the buoy or whatever it would be kind of an unexpected. So when you look at it from a distance, you assume that's what it is, but you go up to it and you have a little surprise. Um, but as far as um, animal products, I buy fur um, from this place called Chesterfield by Niagara Falls, and um, they sell scrap fur <coughs> in bags, so I can say I want like a pound of scrap goat, and then I don't know what I'm gonna get. But I just get like little shredded pieces of goat scrap. Um, and it's like scrap from jackets, and usually it's like armpits and um, weird flawed pieces, which is perfect for me because it's it already has some transition in it because there's a lot of that just has the skin of the leather, and then other areas um, where I I sculpt the like for the cow, I'll sculpt sculpt his her head out of um, a paper mache, and then um, glue the fur on, and then I can shave the fur with a razor to get the transitions um, to make it look really natural. But I don't use any kind of um, taxidermy. The only taxidermy thing I do use is eyeballs. I, I buy my eyeballs from the um, internet from tax service stores. And the eyeballs that I use for my um, monkeys and humans are like uh, off eBay and they're um, um, prosthetic eyes. So they might have had a life before. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Okay. Um, we have a reception waiting for you in the lobby. I just want to say that we're also opening tonight the Lillian B. Feinstein Scholarship Exhibition uh, uh, Reward uh, recipients. 
who are both here, present tonight, Connie Millsaps, fourth year BFA painting and drawing, and who received the upper level Feinstein, and Brooke Craig, third year PMA photo media arts uh, major, who received the lower level Feinstein there in gallery two. So we're celebrating their exhibition tonight too, and I think that's quite lovely to have such a, uh, a pairing. Uh, so let's give Monica another great hand. <laughs> 